uh, in Romans chapter 8, and we are now covering verse 8. And so we've covered the first seven verses. Again, a, a good chunk of information, even though it's only seven verses, uh, but very important information. It's information on the backdrop of the context in which we're in, that's sanctification and its results, how God separated us unto himself for his holy purpose. So there's kind of two parts to sanctification, the issue of separation and separation for a specific purpose, not just any purpose, but a holy purpose, a specific purpose. And what we've learned thus far is how we've been separated. The Spirit has baptized us into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection that has changed our relationship to sin. Uh, on the flip side, it's changed our relationship towards God. And that gives us uh, the ability to not only, we are in Christ, but it gives us the ability to serve God, to live unto God. And the way in which we serve God and live unto God is by walking after the Spirit. Now, we had to come to know all that. That's information that we don't innately know. The, form, the kind of doctrine that we're receiving in Romans 8 is what Paul says over there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16, that all the scriptures given by inspiration of God uh, is profitable for doctrine, correction, and, uh, reproof, and instruction of righteousness. And the kind of doctrine we're getting right now is not correction like he gave in chapter 7. It's instruction in righteousness, or instruction of righteousness. And instruction, usually, by default, a good working definition of instruction is information you don't innately know. Uh, if you're a mechanic and you know how a car runs, whatever brand or whatever kind of car or model, make, year, those type of things, you usually don't need the instruction manual unless there's something you don't know about the car. Um, but those that aren't mechanics, those that don't know well about the car, if, you, if for instance, a fuse goes out and you want to switch your fuse, not uh, take it in, and uh, it costs you $200 just to switch a fuse, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, to switch a fuse, you've got to look at that instruction manual, you've got to know where it is, and then look at what fuse is for what. The instruction manual gives you information that we don't innately know. Well, God's Word is all that, but there's, there's kinds of doctrine to it. This one is overall and generally instruction in righteousness. It's, it's telling us how we righteously live before God and that information is information we do not innately know. We need to learn it from God's word and that's what he's provided uh, for us. And therefore we need to know how to walk after the spirit. He's given us the provision of it in verses 1 through 4 and the mechanics of it in verses 5 through 8 and he's to told us the he's encapsulated the the walking after the flesh and what it produces, what, it, what the end result is in God's sight. And what he's going to begin to do now in ending that, he's going to, uh, uh, in the way in which he talks about it, in the flip side of, walk, uh, of walking after the flesh, flesh, walking after the spirit, is going to tell us that that's the means by which we please God. And then he's going to go into some other information, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But we're currently in verse 8. And again, the way in which we walk after the flesh, which we don't want to do, is by minding the things of the flesh. When we mind the things of the flesh, our mind becomes carnal. And when our mind becomes carnal, that is death. Out of that mind that is death will therefore produce death. It will not produce fruit that pleases God. And the reason why the carnal mind is death is because it's enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. It's the law of God is holy, righteous, and good, but as we try to utilize it to function unto God, all it produces is, is to, to, to operate out of our flesh, and when, it's out, when we produce something out of our flesh, that's why it's death. And therefore, we're not subject to the law of God. We can never be brought completely under the authority of the law because the law wants our flesh to perform it, and we can't perform it out of our flesh. And not only that, he says, neither indeed can be. I brought it up in just the example of, you might think that you have a good day, that you could try to utilize the law to try to live unto God, restrain sin to live unto God, utilizing the law, you might have some good days. And that, that, those last few words there, those last four words of verse 7, come along and say, not from God's perspective. We can never be brought into the subjection of the law of God in and through the flesh. It, 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 indeed, we can't be. And so that's where we left off, and now we're dealing with verse 8, his mini conclusion of the consequences of walking after the flesh. There's two main things here in verse 8. The one is the, the certain state and condition of our mind, 
not our identity, not the certain state and condition of our identity, but of our mind, who is being described here, and then the, that result of, of that certain state and condition of our mind, uh, what it is before God. And hopefully you can see that here in verse 8. It says, so then they, that's those in Christ, but that are walking after the flesh, that are in the flesh. When we walk after the flesh, minding the things of the flesh, our mind becomes carnal. That mind is death. It's enmity against God. It can't be subject, neither indeed can be. All those things. And now Paul's characterizing it is that when that's taking place, you're in the flesh. Um, Usually when this expression is used in Christianity or in the grace message, uh, it's usually used in the sense of when we uh, have committed a sin or someone um, you know, got angry or something like that and they say, I was, just, I was just in the flesh. That, again, I just bring this up, that, that's not, not true that's, that you can say it that way. There's nothing wrong with that. But in regards to what Paul's dealing with, again, when he's talking about walking after the flesh, he's not only talking about just sinning, he's talking about how you're trying to restrain sin. What are you using for that? And so when, when a Christian comes along and they, they esteem the law of God or they esteem their own wisdom, that's coming along and they say that that, that that law of God or their own wisdom or the wisdom of the world, or a psychologist, the philosopher, that they have this information that's, that's trying to go against sin. Because it has that feature to it, that it's, it's good. We usually don't equate that to being in the flesh. And that's how, how uh, God, our Heavenly Father, wants us to see that. He wants us to see the law of God and every other system that we use to try to restrain sin and live unto him, whether it's good or bad, as, as far as how we look at it, if it's not the things of the Spirit that he's going to give us and he's already given us, we need to view it that if we're utilizing that, then we're functioning in the flesh. We ourselves are in Christ, but our mind and what we're utilizing in regards to our walk, that's being generated by what's going on in our mind, what's going on in our inner man, that is in the flesh. It's being influenced by the flesh. And so that's what we have to come to see now in regards to in the flesh. Now, uh, again, I'll just briefly review. The context has changed here. In Romans 7, verse 5, um, you don't have to turn there, but he says, for when we were in the flesh... He's referring to before we were believers, okay? And that's why we went through those extension studies real quick of the spirit, soul, and body. Um, this is a good structure and framework to be able to handle a lot of things in Paul's epistles. Um, and, that's, and this is one of them. Because in Romans 7, verse 5, he says, for when, but when we were in the flesh, he's talking about not only our, 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 our position in regards to before we were believers, we were in Adam, but he was talking about as we were in Adam, what we utilized in connection with what we minded, that was the law. And he characterized that as in the flesh. So there's two aspects of being in the flesh. Your position, your identity which now has changed. We're no longer in the flesh in regards to our identity. We are in Christ or in the Spirit. And then there's this other issue in regards to our conformity. Our, after being justified and after receiving a new identity in Christ, he wants us to walk after him. There's a goal to what he's done in connection with who we are now in Christ. He wants to conform us. And so that's in connection with what's going on in our inner man, our spirit, our mind, and those type of things. And in connection with that, he can also characterize things as in the flesh. And I showed you that from Galatians on the flip side. Look at that again one more time. Just to get acquainted with it, or if you kind of missed it the first session or if you're just joining us for the second session, uh, that this verse is there for you. And we went to a couple other passages in connection with this, but we'll just do this. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. Galatians 5, verse 25. 
by the way, these Galatians put themselves back under the law. Um, and Paul's correcting and reproving them in regards to that decision. Galatians 5, verse 25. If we, what? Live in the Spirit. Here it is. If we live in the Spirit, that if is if and it's true, okay? We live in the Spirit, let us also what? Walk. walk. That, that issue of walk, also the issue of serve, Paul says in, in Romans 1, I think verse 9, don't quote me on that. He says, I, I, serve, I serve God with my spirit in the gospel of his son. That was a paraphrase. That was exactly what he said. But it's that, that, that issue. I serve in the gospel of his son with, with his spirit, his inner man. Okay, That's his walk. He serves. He walks in regards to his spirit. It's not that his body's not involved. That's where we're headed, Romans 8. But it first starts here. And that can also be classified as now in the spirit. And therefore, this one can never change in regards to our identity. We're in the spirit. We live in the spirit. That, that living in the spirit is consistent with our eternal life. We live there. We live in the spirit. We have him, the promise of the spirit. We're in Christ. That can never change. But this one, what influences our spirit, what influences our mind, can either be influenced in regards to the flesh or the spirit. Um, in fact, he just got done talking about that. He says the flesh lusts this against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh over there. And that's what's going on. And what we are supposed to be doing is yielding to this one, Romans 6. Yielding our mortal bodies and the members of our bodies as those that are alive from the dead as instruments of righteousness unto God. We're supposed to be yielding to this one. Okay? So in Romans 8, when he talks about, so, they, so then they that are in the flesh, he's not talking about being in Christ, because the context of Romans 8 is you're already in Christ. The issue is what you're walking after. And he, what he's doing is in connection with that carnal mind, minding the things of the flesh, specifically the law of God, is that what is taking place is you're conducting yourself now in the flesh or under the influence of the flesh. Okay? The whole thrust of it is that we don't do that, that we walk in the spirit like Paul's exhorting the Galatians to do. Now turn back to um, on your way back to Romans eight. Get Second Corinthians five. So, with that being the, the, the foundation, the groundwork of all this. You can, in this context of our identity, in relation to our soul, talk about live. Okay? He says over there, if we live in the Spirit, uh, let us also walk in the Spirit. But over here, you can also talk about it as live. And the way in which you distinguish which one he's talking about here is based upon the context. You have to be looking at the verses before, verses after, to determine when he, when he brings up live, is he talking about my identity? I live in the Spirit? Or is he talking about my walking in the Spirit? Um, hold your hand in, um, well, well, this Second Corinthians will, will do that for us. Look what he says here. Um, we'll just pick it up here in verse 14. He says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he did die for all, that they which, what? Live. He uses it twice here. They that live, they benefited from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection, obviously. He says that they which live should not henceforth, what? live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. He uses the same, that same word in that, in that sentence, in that verse. He says, they that live. We live. We live in Christ. But let us live unto him in regards to our walk. Okay? Um, turn back to Romans 8. Romans 8. He's going to do it in Romans 8.
Romans 8, verse 12. He says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to what? Live. Live. So he doesn't use walk there. But now he's talking about living, not like he is in Galatians chapter 5, where he says if we live in the Spirit. He's talking about living here in connection with the walk, because that's what the context is. You know that's the context, because the previous verses are all walk, 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 walk. Do, mind, and minding, and minded, and those type of things. The context is telling you how to look at that live. Are you talking about living in connection with living in the Spirit, in relation to our identity, or talking about living in connection with our walk. Does that make sense? Or is that just too confusing right now? Uh, the reason why I go into that is just simply because if you take this as a hard rule, he says live in connection with our identity and, live in, or, or, and walk in connection with uh, the, the activity we're supposed to be involved in, you're going to miss some things in Paul's epistles. And it's all based upon the context. You can't take it as a hard rule. And that's why I, want, I just wanted to show you those verses. But if you have the, the, the framework of being in, the, in, uh, in Christ in regard to our identity as soul, and, and, and uh, we can be in the Spirit or walk after the Spirit, connection with our Spirit, once you have that, now you can look at verses and kind of plop them down on the structure, plop them down on the framework. Um, and that will help you to understand those a little bit more. We'll talk about that more as we go along. Uh, because this issue is, is not done. By the way, when you get over to 1 Thessalonians, one of the verses that we talked about when we talked about the spirit, soul, and body, God is sanctifying us wholly in our spirit, soul, and body. So in connection with Paul's epistles, he's talking about our spirit, soul, and body and separating them unto himself. Um, and, and so that's what he's doing. So it's, this is not going to be the last time we, we ever talk about this information. It's just the, really the beginning of it. Um, So turn back to Romans 8, look at verse 8. So that's the first part. So then they that are in the flesh, in regards to our walk, we can be characterized as in the flesh as if we're walking. And the into the flesh here is not necessarily we're just sinning and we're living carnally, in sin, unrighteous, don't care what about God says or any of those things. In the flesh here is taking something to try to restrain sin and live unto God, but that resource in which we're using to serve God is not of God. I shouldn't say it's not of God. I should say that it's not after the Spirit. Because the law is of God. God gave the law. But it, the way in which it, it was put together, by the way, in the hand of the, the, the mediator, of angel, uh, mediator, mediator of angels, which is not how he gave the other covenants, but how he gave it, how he put it all together, it, 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 it demands that we do it out of our flesh. So that's the problem with, with the law of God, is it, it demands the, the flesh to perform it. The things of the Spirit are not activating our flesh. The things of the Spirit, even though we're participating, we're relying upon those things to do what we innately cannot do. Even though we're doing them, even though we're participating, it's the, the, the power and the resource is of the Spirit. Um, so what he says after that, verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's verses like these that just, it doesn't produce that uh, bondage fear upon you, but that reverent fear. Because the reality is, is that we can, and many do, by the way, walk after the flesh. They live in the flesh in regards to what they're minding. For instance, the law of God. And if one's living in that, and living under that, and being influenced by the things of the flesh, by the law, they're not pleasing God. Or any wisdom or system that they concoct or grab from the world to try to please God. The only way we know how to live on a God is what he tells us. He's the only source of himself. Um, and that's how we, we come to know him and how we're known by him. And so it's a grave three words, cannot please God. It doesn't say, well, they kind of do. You know, the one thing that you hear is, I know that they love God. Or they're really sincere doesn't matter. I've said before, your love and your sincerity is measured by what you believe. 
You can be sincere all you want, but if you don't believe what God says, your sincerity is sincere in the eyes of the world, maybe, but not sincere before God. Um, and that's a, a reality that we, we have to realize and let it do that effectual work in us. If we're in the flesh, by the way in which he is prescribed to us, we're not pleasing God. And, and the issue, Paul is kind of setting up. He's, he's kind of talking about it over here. And Paul does that a lot. He, gives like a, he, he tells us about something, but the way he says it, it's like we, put our, we, we need to put ourselves there and become acquainted with that. Um, and then he'll set something else up over here in regards to the spirit, and that's and we look at that for what how he set it up, and and, and we need to we need to not be acquainted with it in regards to going after that, but we got to get acquainted with it to, to feel that to to, to understand and, and feel it, feel that that if we do that, we're not pleasing God, and then see this one and see this one pleases God, and be persuaded by it, and let it do its work in us. And let it read us. Let it. Sometimes we don't allow it to. We just see it. We say, oh, that's good. That's grand. But yet when we go out from church or we go out doing day-to-day business or whatever it is, we just resort to this one. I'm not saying there's not a process of getting away from that, but at the outset, that's what we need to understand. Here's the, here's the two ways. This is the result of the one. Here's the result of the other. And we need to be able to see one and, and, and see this one in regards to the flesh cannot please God. And this one, on the flip side, does what? Please God. Now, there's one last thing I want to talk about in regards to that issue of please. This is a very fantastic word. Um, it's the first time used in Paul's epistles in here in, here in the book of Romans. And there's a reason for that. Because of the context. Because of three words that I always say, the sense and sequence of God's word. He doesn't talk about please before this in context because when we're unjustified, we can't please him. And now in the context of being justified, having a new position in Christ, we can. He's talking about in the negative that if we're in the flesh, we cannot. But if we are in the spirit and walking after the spirit, we can please God. And the reason why he's doing that is because of the things that we've already covered. Come back with me real quick to Romans 6. When he first initiated this doctrine of living unto God. Based upon um, knowing who we are in Christ. Romans 6 verse 22. What he's doing here. Very similar thing that he's doing in Romans 8. Romans 8 is just encapsulating it all and with one more issue. The issue of that we have no confidence in the flesh and that we would have all the confidence in the spirit. And as he begins to do that, kind of for like the first time here in Romans 6, he's going to talk about the result of living under the law or living under grace. Which, by the way, when we're talking about walking after the spirit, living in the spirit, those type of things, that's the system of under grace. Okay? Um, and as he does that, he brings up the two fruits. Uh, look at verse 21. He says, What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become service to God, ye have your fruit unto what? holiness and the end everlasting life he says here in verse 19 prior to it he says I speak after the manner, manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness and when we first started Romans 6 we talked about not only the definition of sanctification, we talked about the definition of holiness because that's what God wants to get accomplished. Everything that he's going to do in regards to godliness, in regards to Paul's epistles, to the forms of doctrine that he's going to give are unto an end. And that end 
is holiness. Not just righteousness, but holiness. You have something be right, but yet it doesn't, isn't necessarily holy in a specific sense. And when we looked at that, one of the main passages we went to, we went to a, quite, a, uh, quite a few of them, um, we went to Revelation chapter 4, and I want to do that again. And this is going to help us to understand this issue of pleas that Paul's talking about in Romans 8. Come with me to Revelation chapter 4. We're not going to cover everything that we covered when we went through it the first time. So you can go back and review those lessons if you want more on it. But one of the things we did in regards to holiness is we... It's, it's a character, an attribute. It's part of God's essence is his holiness. And therefore, one of the things that we did in examining the issue of holiness was examining his presence, examining his throne, essentially. And we looked over there with Isaiah when Isaiah is before his throne and he explains that he's a man of unclean lips. And usually how holiness is described is it's described in, in, the con, in contrast to sin, unrighteousness, and unholiness. And we look at unholiness and we say, God's not like that, he's holy. But that's sometimes as far as we go. But that's not as far as God goes. Because... If the only way in which we view holiness is in that sense, then, we, then holiness could only, in one sense, exist when sin came into play. And that's not true, because God was before sin entered, and he was always holy. Therefore, to get to the root issue of holiness is not just to see it in contrast to unholiness, which is good, I'm not saying that's bad, but to get to the root issue is you've got to see holiness in regards to the root element of it, not in contrast to unholiness. Does that make sense? So look at Revelation chapter 4. This isn't the only place that does it, but it's a, a really good place to do it. This is after, this is the tribulation period, and when he starts to establish his kingdom, and he deals with the policy of evil, he deals with, essentially with unholiness. He begins to describe the throne. Look at uh, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, the, the first voice which I heard was at, uh, as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the what? Throne. And he describes the, the beauty of the throne and the things that are transpiring around it. Uh, let's jump down to verse 6 for time's sake. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. You ever want to do a fantastic study? Do a study on eyes in the scripture. It was absolutely wonderful. That's just throw it out there. Verse 7. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. I'll throw another little quick thing in there. It's interesting that these are around his throne, and if his throne has always, already, has always existed, God already had a, a template of some creatures before he created the beasts and the fowls of the air here on the earth. Um, even man. When he created man, if this had a face of man, if he already had, so, well, obviously he's God, and therefore, but beyond that, he already had some things up around his throne that he replicated in one sense here on the earth when he created things. Nevertheless, that's not the point. Verse 8, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So... By that verse, we should understand why we're here, why we're looking at holiness, because that's what these beasts say day and night. They say, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. And, and notice it's connected with his issue of his, essentially his name, Lord God, um, which was and is, is, and, and is to come. Um, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And that's part of his name. When, when God introduces his name Jehovah to Moses over there, when Israel's in Egypt for 400 years, 
400 years, that's a long time. And he comes along and he, and, and he says, I, I want you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And he's, you got you to talk to the Israelites and those type of things. And Moses is coming along and saying, well, who, who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am that I am. And that's the issue. I'm the beginning and the end. This is how I start out. This is the way I am at the end. You have that same issue. He's, he's the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. Uh, Alpha and Omega. Do, uh, Omega. Omega. Those type of issues. And the, th the thrust of that was the issue that they've been in bondage for 400 years. It's going to be over 400 years by the time they get out and, and, and by the time he goes there. And the natural question would be, is God going to fulfill his promise with our father Abraham? Is God going to deliver us? That's 400 years. That, he just promised that to our fathers and our father's fathers and our father's 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 father's. And God comes along and says, tell him who I am. I am that I am. And not only that, but I am. I am. And by giving the first, I am that I am, when he gives the second, I am, it's like he gave a blank. Two things. Time doesn't affect me. The promise I give you 400 years, I can get it done 400 later. Give me, even more time is going to go, I'll still get it done. And not only that, I am blank. I'll be, for, I'll be anything that you need me to be for you to get that promise accomplished. And that is usually brought up in, in a lot of context in connection with his holiness. Nevertheless, look what he goes on to say. Look what he goes on to say here, verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their thrones before the throne saying... Some more things that, they, uh, that say that now the 24 elders are involved. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy what? Pleasure they are and were created. That's the radical root issue of holiness, is that holiness is not something that's just right. It's not something that's just set apart. It's set apart because it pleases him. It's his, what the scriptures reference over and over, it's his good pleasure. We can do a lot of things, bring it down to our level. We can do a lot of things that are right, but don't necessarily please us. Probably been in that situation a lot of times, whether at work or family, marriage maybe, those type of things that, you do what's right, but <laughs> there's no pleasure in it. And God doesn't operate that way. He does things that not only are right, but it pleases him. Not only the fact that they are right, and they're a reflection of his character or essence, but it pleases him, the things that he's involved in. You see over in Israel, when that kingdom's set up, and over there in Isaiah chapter 66, and uh, I think it's chapter 66, when it talks about the... Uh, remember it's not Isaiah, maybe it's Zechariah but he talks about in his temple and, and, and things like that, they're going to have pots there and, and he says it's holiness unto the Lord and you're like, a pot? a pot? and then it talks about the cow's bells and it's going to describe holiness unto the Lord and you're like, what? those are the things that please him and I brought that up when we were going through this in regards to uh, maybe you have a room at home and this might be more fitting, a little bit more for women not only for women, because I love to decorate my office. And I put things up on my office, on my wall, and those type of things that they're pleasing to my eye. They're, they're a quote or words that they inspire me. They get me motivated. They're usually in connection with the Word of God. And I have things around me that, that they're just my pleasure. I go into my office. Besides my lights, i got to get some better lights because I just got one. But... It's the only thing that doesn't please me in my, my office. But you go in, and I got pictures of my, my family. I got my desk. I, 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 I like to color my desk. It's black. And it's, it's glass. And it's a, it's a corner one, but I don't have it in the, the corner necessarily. And I got a bookshelf with all the books that I like and the, and the books that I use as resources and I've read. The ones I don't like, I throw out. Or I sell them at half-price books. 
<laughs> buy more better books. And I got a, I got a, it's also our guest room, so we got a, but we got a futon, because for some reason I like a futon. I don't know why I like a futon. I got a chair that I go and read in, because my computer chair I don't necessarily like. And I got a TV, because I want to watch a sermon or something like that, and, and, and I can just sit back in my chair and, and watch a sermon. And all that stuff is there, because, and, and you pick it out. And, and, and my wife helps me out a lot. Michelle helps out a lot with, when I was looking at the chairs and things like that. And, and, and she knows me, and so she, she saw the chair and she brought it up. And, but she'll usually bring a couple out and she'll let me choose because it's, it's what we consider my office. And therefore, we put a chair in there in connection with what I would like. And I, take, I look at three, and I don't even necessarily know why I like one color, but I like that one. And maybe in a different room, I wouldn't like that one, but I like that one. And I just say all that, more or less to be silly, but in another sense to show that there are things that please us. And that's, there's getting to, the issue is what, in, in the grand scheme of things, those things are really small issues. Not that they're not important, because even those things ought to be governed by God's holiness. I shouldn't be putting things up on the walls that aren't, uh, holy in their, in, their, in their own sense. Um, but all, when you, we're talking about the, God's holiness, there, it's things that please Him. And we ought to want to please Him. And the way in which we please Him is He tells us. Because we don't innately know that by nature we don't know how to please Him. We think we do. That's what part of our nature does. But we don't. And we are to come to God's word and, and understanding him and what he has for us that way. And, and, and when you realize that, you start to see that sense and sequence of God's word. I'm going to teach you what pleases me. I'm going to teach you what to think. And when you think in light of that, you're thinking holy thoughts. We are holy. Our identity in Christ is holy because we're in him. But in regards to what we think, in regards to what we do, that's something else that God wants to make holy. And when we do it in the flesh and after the flesh, by minding the things of the flesh, that alternative competing authority, whatever it may be, that doesn't please him. That's not coming from him. And so this issue now of, of Romans 8, that we can't please him, the flip side of that is when we walk after the Spirit, we can. And that's what he began to introduce back at chapter 6 of Romans. Come back there with me one more time. Romans chapter 6. Boiling down God's end with us is that we would not only be positionally holy, but our conformity to Him would be holy as well. That we would think like Him, live with Him, and labor with Him. And that's what He, again, fundamentally began to be established here in Romans 6. Look at verse 22 again. And I'll be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye you have your fruit unto holiness. We were planted in Romans 6, verse, um, verse 5 there. We were planted together in the likeness of, of, of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for the goal of not just be, being a root under the ground. That has to take place first. God did that for us. But for the sake of growing and maturing and bearing fruit, and that fruit being consistent with the root. That fruit unto holiness, that fruit pleasing to God. And what he set forth in Romans, uh, the second half of, of Romans 6, all of chapter 7, and, and this, this, the first quarter of Romans 8, is that if it's after the flesh, we cannot please him. And the very things we used to do in Adam, walking after, the, being in the flesh, twofold, in our identity and in our walk, Although we're not in the flesh in regards to our identity, if we go after the flesh in regards to our walk, then we're going to produce those, that same fruit we produced then that we, are ashamed, we should be ashamed of now will we'll produce again. And God has given us the capacity not to do that. And to have fruit that's pleasing and it's delightful. He ever wants it around him. And that's why he says, and the end everlasting life. The reason, as we went through this, the reason why he gave us eternal life in the first place was not an end in itself. Romans 1 through 5, the gospel of Christ of how we become justified unto eternal life was not an end in itself. It was a means to this end. 
so that we could bring forth fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life, that our fruit can be consistent with what we already have, and we can have fruit that goes from not just this life, but into the next. It's the only thing that can translate from this life to the next, because it first and foremost works in our inner man. In our inner man, our spirit, what we build up there is the only thing we can take out. And that's going to be tried, by the way, at the judgment seat of Christ. We don't try it now. We don't burn it up now. It's going to be tried there and burned there. And, what he, and, and, and that's why he gave us eternal life. Is that our life, our thinking and our conduct and behavior can line up with who he's made us to be as we follow those things of the spirit by, by learning them and then minding them. And when we do that, we are minding the things of the spirit. He's going to do something in connection with our body. And then as we utilize our body, not only as well as our mind, we're going to produce the fruit of the spirit. And that fruit is pleasing and delightful unto God. It's unto holiness. And that fruit has a that fruit has a purpose. That's why when we talked about sanctification, it was, it was a separation of God for his holy purpose. This fruit that we're involved in, the, the end of the fruit isn't just simply to be holy. The end of the fruit has a, has a purpose to it. That's what he's going to come and speak about later on in Romans 8. That when we participate in this fruit, the things of the Spirit as He gives them to us, and we learn it, and now we're going to mind it, when we're doing that, there's a reason why we're doing that. Not only for the sake that it's right and it's holy, there's a purpose behind that, and that's where the mystery is going to come into play. He hasn't brought the mystery before this. But the things He's going to begin to say in Romans 8, even though He doesn't use the word mystery, they're mystery in the sense that he hasn't spoken about this in, in, in the Old Testament. And when we talked about that spirit of holiness in Romans 1, I, I showed you that he's talking about the spiritual things in the New, the New Testament that we are ministers of, that we're beneficiaries of, which is justification and sanctification. But there is going to come a time in Paul's epistles, specifically in Romans 8, that when we learn that we're made spiritually fit by those spiritual things in the New Testament, just as Israel is made, it was, it was, going, was beginning to be made and is going to be made spiritually fit to enter into that kingdom, they're made spiritually fit, justified, and sanctified for a purpose. And the reason why they're doing their good works are vastly, not vastly, but there's enough difference, it's different than why we do good works. The reason why they're going to do good works out here is to have their, their conversation honest among the Gentiles so that some Gentiles can be saved and get into that kingdom. Well, we're not doing good works and having our, our conversation. We do have a conversation. He's going to say our conversation is heaven. And therefore, why we participate in good works, being made spiritually fit, is what Romans 8 is going to teach us. It's for a, a purpose in regards. And he doesn't say heavenly places first. He doesn't call it that first. He calls it the creature. And that's why we're the new creature, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because there's a creature up there in those places. There's a living organism that operates and functions. And as we participate in this newness of life by walking after the Spirit and being in the Spirit and producing this fruit that pleases God, all that has a purpose to it in connection with the creature. And everything else from Paul's epistles from here on out as we get into Romans 8, they're attached to that purpose sitting in Romans 8. Romans 8 is like the hub of the wheel. And everything else is just attached to it. And every one of those things in Romans 12 that we're eventually going to go through of how we think about one another and abhorring evil and cleaving to that which is good and, and the issue of being kindly affectionate one to another and brotherly love and honor preferring one another. All that's good. All that's going to be holy. Those are the things of the Spirit that we're going to learn and mind and do with one another. But there's a reason. There's a purpose behind it. And that separates us from everything else. Because we know why we're doing what we're doing. We're not just doing it to do it. You know, that's most of what Christianity thinks. That's what I used to think. Well, God said this, I'm just going to do it. Well, that's, that's good. 
The problem with that is God doesn't just do this because I say it. In fact, that's childhood. With Abigail Josiah, you just do it. I don't have to explain to you why. You just, just do it. You, you don't, you can't, you're not at the level of maturity yet to understand this. There's, there are some things, but not everything. That's childhood. That's how you treat a child. That's how we treat Israel. Don't do this, do this. Don't do this, don't do this. But you didn't give, it, give them the spirit behind it. Why? Why don't do this and why not do this? Why do this? With us, he gives us that in regards to our program. He tells us why. And that why is in Romans 8. And everything else we attach back to the everything that we're going to get. And I'll be honest up front. I don't, I can't, I don't have all the ties yet. But I have some. That we're going to learn in Romans 12, 13, 14. We're going to learn in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. All have tie to how we're going to live in the heavenly places. All of them. And what you get by that instruction of how we are to live, those things of the Spirit, what's attached to it is that, that, that is able to translate into the life that is to come. The things that we're going to be doing now, the, I should probably stop right now because I'm getting the cart way before the horse. But we're so close and it's hard for me to, to bite my tongue right now. But everything, everything, there's a reason why you're going to take God's word and do it because it has correlation and connection with what's going to take place up there. Your marriage, your work, your family, your friends, your giving here at church, where you go, what you do, he's going to renew it. That's what part of the renewing of, of the mind is. Not only renew it in regards to what you think, and think but, but bring that in regards to how it's going to function up there. Absolute, absolutely fabulous. And he, he, there's two aspects of the life that is to come. Well, there's more than that, but to break it down. That's in regards to the creature and in regards to the heavenly places. The creature is in regards to the living organism, the functionality of what we're going to be doing up there, one with another. The other one is the structure, the heavenly places. There's a change in the functionality up there by us manifesting what we've come to learn here. And then there's gonna be, we're going to be involved in a, a restructuring of the heavenly places in regards to its government, in regards to its places. That stuff blows your mind. There, there is meaning behind the hope of his calling. Not just getting there. Yeah. Not just the fact that we're going to be in the heavens and on the earth, not on the earth. But the fact of what we're going to be doing there. That's all involved in what we're coming to learn. And I, I'm just throwing it out there, but my main goal was to, 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 to explain how the fruit on the holiness that he began to introduce is now getting added to in regards to our understanding of it. It's not only pleasing and delightful, and not only does it correlate, or not only is it going to, the end of its everlasting life, that it can exist beyond the life that now is, but that's going to be added to that there's reason and purpose behind the fruit and what we do. And that's going to be one of the main motivators of why we do what we do. When you know why you're doing what you're doing, that's a huge motivation and what it can work toward and how you relate with one another and, and knowing the fruit for that person that you can have with, with that person and, and also what it, what it can be unto in regards to life to come. You start thinking the way God thinks about things. It's absolutely phenomenal. And that's all coming. And the issue is, is that right now where we're at, in the flesh, walking after the flesh doesn't get you any of that. The law doesn't get you any of that. In fact, the one reason why he says that we're not under the law is because under the law, whatever way in which you want to look at it, functions for an earthly realm. The law's use is in regard to an earthly realm. 
The law doesn't provide any information in regards to the reconciliation of the heavenly places. It doesn't, it doesn't provide that information. That's one of the reasons why we, we can't be under the law. And Paul's epistles in the grace in connection with the dispensation of grace is tailor-made for us, but it has these components resident within it in regards to the fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So turn back with me to Romans chapter 8. So when he says there in verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They cannot bring anything that's fruit unto holiness. They bring fruit, but it's not unto holiness. And they might think that they're pleasing God, but from God's perspective, it's not pleasing Him. And on the flip side of that, when we walk after the Spirit and are in the Spirit in regards to our walk and influenced by the Spirit, then we do bring that fruit unto holiness. And then we are pleasing God. And that's a, that itself, again, that's not the only thing that we're going to learn regarding that, but that itself is part of the, the motivation that we, he's put us in a position and he has things for us that we're going to mind and when we do that we can please him. He's provided us to be able to please him. And that's what we ought to be going after. Well, I got to conclude. Let me just say this in conclusion in regards to where we're going. When we get to verse 9, 10, and 11, it goes from this spirit, the mind, what's going on inwardly, to this. And that has to take place because we still have sin in our body. We have, to, we have to be described to us how God is able to take this mortal body with sin still in it. He's dealt with the mind and be able to utilize it for him. There's that, we may not think that has to be dealt with. We might just think, oh, that's God's God. He can do whatever he wants. But again, he, gives us, he tells us why and he tells us and, and, and how he gets it done. And he tells us that so we can have, again, that full confidence that when we're walking after the Spirit, when we're minding the things of the Spirit, when we utilize our body to express and manifest in tangible form, whether it be by what we speak, even though we speak as Spirit, but we're doing something, or whether we, how we use our hands or our feet or, or, or whatever that may be, that even though this mortal body... Uh, we're utilizing it, that the Spirit is involved and that what we're doing is actually pleasing unto God. It's giving us that full confidence. That's what he's doing by giving us the information so that we would know and that we would have that full confidence that as we walk after the Spirit, even though we have this body, we can be the express manifestation of those things of the Spirit that we have inwardly that we can manifest them. And that's something that he's got to cover. And that started back in chapter 6, and so we'll look at that. Again, we'll probably take two, three weeks dealing with that. And then we're going to have a Lord's table and as a corporate body discuss these things, one with another, if there's any questions regarding them, uh, to, to, um, to as much as we can provide for, be like-minded in regards to them and deal with any snags in our thinking that we have. And then we'll move on to 12 and 13, uh, the exhortation to now mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit and, and live unto God, how we kind of left off in Romans 6, verse 11, um, and then 12 and 13. And then after that, we'll have another Lord's table, and we'll discuss that and, and solidify it. All that. And then we're going to be moving on. And like I said, what begins to happen then is that shift from learning about the mechanics of walking after the Spirit to, it, it, by minding the things of the Spirit, to actually receiving the things of the Spirit. And the very first kind of initial thing of the Spirit that we learn about is something about Him. We learn that He's not just the Holy Spirit, that which He is, but He's the Spirit of adoption. And that has great, great significance. And so that's what we'll begin to look at. And then we'll see, in light of him being the spirit of adoption, how he's going to educate us, what he's going to educate, the order in which he's going to educate us, 
And that begins the framework of those things of how he's going to actually begin to give them to us. And then once we get done with 14 and 15, verse 16, the spirit beareth witness with our spirit. Here we go. Awesome. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, again, to get in your word, to uh, wrap up <clears throat> verses 5 through 9, this section of information that deals with our inner man in regards to our mind, in connection with walking after the Spirit. And two things were set forth, Father, that we have come to understand, is that one of walking after the flesh and walking after the Spirit, the one you don't want us to participate in, the other you do. And the reasons why you don't want us to participate in the one and why you want us to participate in the other one. The reason why we're not to participate in walking after the flesh is because we mind the things of the flesh and what happens with our mind is we become carnally minded and that is death before you. And that the reason why it's a carnal mind is because the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God and neither indeed can be. And once that is taking place, we, are, we can be characterized as being in the flesh and when we're functioning as such, we cannot please you. We are in Christ, but out of that carnal mind, there's nothing that we're doing fruitfully that is holy in regards to our walk and our service before you. And therefore, we should have no confidence, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, in the flesh. But rather, we should have full confidence and full persuasion of mind and, and full convincement of heart that to walk after the Spirit is the best choice. Be persuaded as a servant that you've made us to be and therefore walk after the Spirit by mind and the things of the Spirit. Have our mind be spiritually minded, which is life, and be able to please you and bring forth that fruit unto holiness. So Father, we thank you for this information that has set forth those components and that information to us. And as we move forward next week, May we get acquainted with the information sitting in verses 9 and 11 and see how that is going to impact our body and, and, and draw those connections. So, Father, we thank you for this time of being able to get into your word and redeeming the time to your honor and glory. If there's someone here listening that has not trusted Christ as their all-sufficient Savior, how they died for their sins, was buried, and rose again, may they believe that good news this very moment. And the reason why it's good news is because all they have right now is bad news. His wrath is against their sin. And there's no escape in and of itself, in and of themselves from it. And the way in which they can change that is to believe that good news. Believe they are sinners and believe that they have a penalty of their sin that they cannot pay. But Christ paid it for them. That he paid for the complete debt and penalty of their sins and he rose again. And now he's offering that to them as a free gift. And the way in which they're saved from that predicament and the way in which they're justified by, is by receiving that gift by faith and faith alone. And the moment God sees their faith trusting in Christ, he'll justify them unto eternal life, forgive them all their sins, past, present, future, impute his righteousness unto them, and they will therefore possess the gift of eternal life. May they believe this very moment. And Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly or out of necessity. We give in connection with our ability to do if we do not have the ability to do that because we do not have the resources to do so, you teach us that you accept a willing mind. And therefore, our heart attitude as the leaders of Twin Cities Grace Fellowship and the elders is that we too accept a willing mind. But if, you're able, if they're able to, they give not grudgingly, not on necessity, but lovingly and cheerfully, for you love a cheerful giver. Knowing why they give because you do not maintain and sustain Twin Cities Grace Fellowship by your omnipotent hand. You maintain and sustain Twin Cities Grace Fellowship by the word of God working effectually in the saints, knowing it is through their resources that this assembly is maintained and sustained. Father, we thank you that we can know why we give and that we can participate in laboring with you in what you're doing today. And so, Father, we, we, we give in that fashion in response to your grace, in response to the word of God working in us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.